So uh, let me introduce her and the five careers. So she graduated Tong Medical School at uh, Medical University in China, so in 1994, so MD. And so then she uh, moved to the US and so uh, she did her uh, a training as a graduate student, as a graduate student in the, uh, UC San Diego. And then uh, she, she started so, uh, a training and so, uh, the PhD, uh, no, no, the postdoctoral training in uh, uh, SOAP Institute and the uh, mental uh, uh, And so she moved to, okay, uh, uh, joined the faculty in the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in uh, 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 2003 as assistant professor of the Institute of Cell Engineering and Department of Neurology and Science. Okay, so then uh, she promoted associate professor in 2007 in Hopkins and then as uh, full professor in 2011. Then she moved to uh, the UPenn as a professor uh, of the human stem cell yeah, the education institute. Okay, in 2017. Uh, 2017. Okay. Okay, so then uh, she is now, okay, uh, after the 2000, she is endowed the chair of the Parliament. So Pennsylvania. Okay, as you know, she's very well known about so development, so human organ technology, and so they published the plenty of the other uh, papers, and so developed a very, very important platform of the human uh, the um, brain organ technologies. And she is going to talk about engineering human brain organoids for modern uh, brain development, injury, and disorders. Okay, <laughs> will you please? <laughs> Of course, I would also like to thank you for the invitation and for the kind introduction. So uh, in parallel to what Hongjun have told you, you using mouse, mainly using mouse models to study human brain development. My lab is main, mainly interested in using the human cellular models to study brain uh, development. I guess there's not really no need for me to do the introduction is that we use a IPS-based model, which is developed by Shinya Yamanaka's group. And this is this IPS system is pluripotent, as you know, and in principle, it can be used to generate all types of human cells. And more recently, there are protocols developed to generate 3D structures, which is termed organoids from this pluripotent stem cells, either ES cells or IPSCs. And in most cases, these 3D structures has to be cultured on the suspension conditions so that they don't flat, flatten out. And uh, for today's talk, and also for my interest, I me talk about IPSC uh, derived brain organoids. And in this is a really rapid moving field. And in the past few years, there are many protocols being generated to generate different brain region specific organoids, uh, starting from IPSCs. And here just list some of them. And for example, you can generate whole brain uh, organoids, which largely contain our cerebral cortex. You can also generate MDE organoids, which is the ventral um, whole brain. And also, of course, you can generate organoids uh, with the origin of midbrain high brain, as well as spinal cord. It's really based on what we know about, about the developmental biology and we're using a combination of different uh, morphogens, for example, wind signaling, BMP signaling, FDF signaling, and RA signaling. And for the first of part of the talk, I mainly focus on uh, cortical organoids. And there are many, uh, uh, similarities 
when you talk about cortical development between the rodent systems and the human systems, for example, they all start from neural epithelial cells. And this generate brain region specific radial glial cells that further generate brain region specific tissues and cells. And there are also many differences if you compare the human cortical development and the mouse development. And I'll point out throughout my talk. For example, one of the major difference, difference is that in human cortical development, we have additional population of neural stem cells that is localized in outer subventricular zone or OSVZ uh, here. Okay. Uh, um, so this is the this additional population of neural stem cells uh, contributing to the further expansion of our cerebral cortex and the generation of additional numbers of neurons and glial cells. So exactly based on this developmental principle, we started to develop protocols for generating four brain specific organoids. And this project really starts with two graduate students and three high school students, because we could not find a machine allowing us to uh, so efficiently uh, comparing different protocol conditions. And with the help of three high school students, they use 3D design and 3D printing to generate this uh, miniaturized spinning bioarray actor, which is showing here. And you can also see the movie and the little white blobs you are seeing are uh, brain organoids. This, this, you, this device is basically adapted directly on top of a 12 well or 24 well plates so that we can, every well is become a, a bioreactor and we can in parallel uh, screening for different conditions. And eventually we end up with the protocol that's, that's essentially following the brain development principles. For example, starting from IPSC, we uh, first using the dual SMAT strategy to generate neuroepithelial cells and then further specify them uh, to forebrain neural stem cells or radial glial cells. And after the, this past initial two weeks of patterning, everything becomes intrinsic and the self-organization properties of these stem cells. The neurogenesis, gliogenesis, and the maturation basically is a self-organizing property. And by uh, 100 days, you can see this brain organoid can that can grow actually quite large in size, close to half centimeters. So you can see them. I think some of you are working on this, so you know that. And this is published already. So I'm going to just summarize what we have seen from this full brain organoids. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, we show that in our organoids, it contains the specific human specific neurostem cells sized in OSVZ. And in this picture, all the orange uh, colored cells are neural stem cells. So they're traditional dense layer of stem cells localizing VZ, ISVZ. But there's, you can also see or, uh, orange color cells in OSVZ. Um, and the, if you compare the general structural organization, it's actually quite comparable directly to human gestation week 22 tissues by day 100. And furthermore, we show that in our organoids by day 80 to 100, we see a rudimentary lamina organization and many of the cortical neurons in our organoids can express the markers for all six cortical layers. However, as showing here, the separation is not really clear or, uh, or distinct because this happens in human brain development much later uh, in time. And uh, by uh, directly performing electrophysiology on those cortical neurons, we show that they are functional, not only receiving excitatory synaptic inputs, but also inhibitory synaptic inputs. And in, 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 uh, in addition, 
although I didn't show you the data here, but we also see there's in at the later times there's a gliogenesis, mainly astrocytes, but we haven't observed any oligodendrocytes. This is also the late generation uh, glial populations. We can also compare the developmental timing by looking at the molecular signatures. So we performed the RNA sequencing of our, or of our organoids at the different time points and directly compared to the available uh, RNA seq data points uh, from the human samples uh, the, from the um, prefrontal cortex, for example. And we can show that by day 100, our organoids is pretty much similar to what has been uh, observed in human, by the second uh, trimester human tissue. Um, one of the limitations, I get, uh, I think about this brain organoid is that they do not, since we are patterning them directly to the neural lineage, they do not contain vasculatures, which comes from a completely different uh, uh, lineage. And because also of this organoids can grow much bigger in size, that means when this grow, organoids grow, extend the diffusion, the physical diffusion limits for nutrients and oxygen, which is usually about only 400 micron for solid tissues, we start to get necrosis in this organoids. Uh, so that the one they grow bigger and bigger, the necrosis also becomes and bigger and bigger. And since all the stem cells are localized in the center, when, as I showed in earlier in the, in the image, most of these dying cells are stem cells. That limits the maturation, of course, because it, if you lose the stem cells, you, you lose the further neurogenesis, you lose the further gliogenesis. So that's also it, that could also explain why we can only see the maturation up to the second trimester, but not beyond that. And also I mentioned that we have never seen in our organoids, uh, the, the oligodendrocytes, the myelinating glial cells. So a former graduate student who is doing a postdoc right now uh, at Harvard, he came up with the idea uh, or for, with, the, with the slicing because he tried many different things by putting vasculature cells, usually think if we do not, if the organoids are lacking vasculature, if we supplement them with the vasculature cells, maybe that could help. But the, soon, very soon we realize, even if you have the vasculature forming within the organoid, you do not have a heart to pump. There's no perfusion. So that does not really help in the end. We have also tried many other approaches, but uh, none of them actually worked. So she came up with this idea is just by physically slicing the organoids so that we can keep the organoids within the diffusion limit. So how can we do that? The way he did is when the organoids grow about up to one millimeter in size, um, and which is uh, showing here, he put the, this organoids into the agarose and the, make two cuts onto this organoids. He get rid of the top um, part and also get rid of the bottom part. So he only keep a very thick sliced organoids. That's why he kept, called them SNOs, sliced neocortical organoids. And basically what you get is from one organoid, you only keep one centerpiece. The reason for that is that at this time, all the, the neural stem cell layer is only about 200 micron. So we can maximally maintain all the neural stem cells within the organoid this way. And also I already mentioned the diffusion limit is about 400 micron. Given that the diffusion can happen from the top and the bottom, you have about 800 micron to one millimeter in actually uh, uh, width to gr further grow. And that's actually, that is the case. You can see that uh, we can see that our organoids after the slicing, because we maintain all the stem cells, they can still grow, not only at the X, Y direction, but also at the Z direction. So he decided to take the pain and slice them every month, uh, every four weeks to, for, 
keep maintain them within the diffusion limit so that they can continue to grow. And really, I hope you can also realize that when we do the slicing this way, the X, Y axis has never been touched. So it's, it's actually, it's intact at all times. So the slice is always at the same uh, uh, plane. And with that, I can show uh, uh, the images with this uh, snow approach. You can see that now even at 70 days and 100 days, we do not get real necrosis. And the, the SVZ and OSVZ stem cell layers are very well maintained. Can actually follow the development of this neural stem cells over time and directly compare the SNOs and on slice. You can see that by at day 70, although the structure is pretty much similar in SNOs, we can see continuous expansion, especially the OSVZ zone. This is because in human development, OSVZ becomes also dominant for the, as the stem cell pool, where you see a decrease actually in size of the VZ and ISVZ. And if you compare to without slicing, because of the death of the neural stem cells, you can actually see the uh, uh, reduction in the width of the stem cell zones in, uh, as uh, some uh, uh, quantified uh, at the right, um, uh, in, the, in the right. Another feature, human specific feature has been identified by uh, uh, Arnold Krigerstein's lab actually quite recently in 2017, where they showed in human court, they, they use directly the uh, uh, human tissues, uh, abor abortion tissues, human pre prefrontal cortical aborted tissues to show that two very commonly used markers. This has also been mentioned in Hong Jun's talk that for example, C-tip, the deep cortical layer marker and CEPTB2, it's commonly used the upper cortical neuron marker. And in human development, you can see that the neurons born at the early times, they co-express these two markers for extended period of time, almost for two months of time before the segregation, uh, which does not really uh, as the seen as a prominent feature when you look at the rodent uh, mouse cortical development. Exactly the same color, the green one is the CTIP2 and the red one is CTIP2. You don't really see extensive. And also because the mouse brain develops so fast within a week, you don't really see this overlap quite uh, uh, in, in the mouse uh, cortical development. What happens in our organoids? And we can also show that for um, during the early cortical development, this is an example at day 70, the almost 100% of the cells co-express these markers at this early time point. That gave us the opportunity to look when did the segregation happen and potentially for us to understand the, uh, the underlying mechanisms. So we use two set of markers uh, for deep cortical neurons and upper cortical neurons, I already mentioned CTIP2 and CETB2. Uh, we also use RORB1 as an upper cortical neuron marker ROR, uh, and also TBR1 as a deep cortical neuron markers. And for both cases, we started to the see the segregation happens between day 100 and day 120. You can see two peaks at the beginning, at the early time points, they are co-expressed, and by 100, day, day 120, you see clear two peaks of these two uh, different markers. And also, at the same time, the co-labeling decreased dramatically during this period of time. And so what are, could be the potential mechanisms governing this segregation of these two markers or phase specification of deep cortical neurons and upper cortical neurons. We noticed there's one paper published actually quite early on by a uh, um, uh, UCLA group in 2004, where they show that in human cortex, uh, there's a specific expression pattern of WIND7B, which is localized in deep cortical, oh, thank you, 
which is localized in the subplate. And this is the region where uh, the, the deep cortical neurons become specified. And when we look at the expression pattern of them being our organoids, we found indeed, it seems that the wind 7 b expression happens after the day 70. And by the 100, when the segregation, it, it seems to precede the segregation happening um, uh, uh, and they start to express with, it, within this sub uh, plate uh, regions. Uh, and you can see uh, it only expressed in the deep cortical neuron regions, suggesting WIND7B probably plays an important role in the phase specification and the segregation of deep and uh, uh, cortical neurons. And to further uh, uh, look into this, the wind signaling uh, in, in this regulation, we use the pharmacological manipulations, either activating the wind signaling or inhibiting the wind signaling. And in both cases, we saw a disrupt, disruption of the, the, uh, the, the fate uh, segregate, segregation. And another unique feature is why we are interested in the segregation of upper cortical neurons and the deep cortical neurons. This is because they actually perform distinct functions in the brain. For example, the upper cortical neurons, they are also called colossal projecting neurons. These are the neurons are, are responsible for connect, communicating chiasm uh, to, 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 to the second brain there. Excellent. And um, the deep cortical neurons, they also call the subcortical projection neurons, meaning that they are mainly making connections within the same hemisphere. They are talking within the same hemisphere. So to look at whether the neurons after the phase specification, they also have a uh, uh, um, specific specified axonal projection patterns. We use the specific marker called SMI312, and I hope you can uh, appreciate that in the region where uh, upper cortical neurons are specified, they send their axons in parallel uh, to the peel surface of the of the organoids, whereas in the regions of deep cortical neurons specified. Their axons actually are perpendicular to the, their specific axonal projection also in our organoids. To further examine the function of neurons, we have done two things. We can either directly perform wholesale recording, and this is actually a, a neuron that is being recorded and then we have a dye in shape. This neuron have ex very extensive and a robust dendritic structures and a single axon go going in parallel, ex extending millimeters in length, uh, uh, parallel to the peel surface, <laughs> suggesting this could be an upper cortical neuron. And also, we can potentially look at the net productivity by using a, 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 a electrode, a, a, a common electrode. And as showing here, this is the device. And you can see that the electrodes is directly inserting into a whole SNO organoid. But you further, if you further zoom in the electrodes, actually there are four shafts. And each of these shafts contains 16 recording units. And I'm just showing an example here to show that indeed the neurons within the organoids are talking to each other. For example, the one electrode uh, labeled in red here is always firing first. And this is followed by the electrode here, uh, which is 500 micron away. So it's unlikely it's from the same cell. And the one firing the last is the one labeled by green here. This is also uh, about five, 500 micron away uh, from each uh, from the other two electrodes. So you, we can see a pattern that 
uh, red cells fire first, followed by the black cells and followed by the green cells, suggest the cells, the neurons are indeed also talking to each other uh, within this organoids. So in addition to neurons, we can also see whether there are other cellular populations within our organoids, and we can do this by uh, performing single cell RNA days, we can see a uh, different population of upper cortical neurons, upper layer uh, one and two. We can also see uh, deep cortical neurons, uh, uh, different types, subtypes. Of course, we still have, we have maintained uh, progenitor cells and the radial glial cells. We can clearly segregate, segregate them into distinct clusters using RNA. -C. We can also see astrocyte clusters. So, um, and unlike neurons, we can use different markers to label them. The astrocytes, actually, we don't really have my, uh, robust markers to label, to label distinct subtypes of astrocytes, although we can classify them based on their localization and their morphology. And showing here are some examples of multiple uh, subtypes of astrocytes uh, uh, that has been identified in the human uh, cortex. And uniquely, there's one subtype of astrocytes called the internaminal astrocytes. This is again, human specific and it localized in only layer one. So we decided to look what kind of uh, astrocytes we can have in our organoids. And as sh showing here, all the astrocytes are labeled by GFAP and based on their morphology, as well as localization, we can see there are multiple subtypes of astrocytes we can identify in our organoids. For example, fibrous and the protoplasmic, and more importantly, the human specific internamina uh, subtype of astrocytes, which is only localized at the very surface of the organoids. And as if you, uh, you can imagine, this is a very similar close to the layer one uh, localization within the organoids. And also uh, in our snow organoids, we start to see the late born astro uh, glial cells, which is the oligodendrocytes, by 100, day 20, we can see progenitor cells of oligodendrocytes that can be labeled by NKX 2.2 and oligo 2. And by 100, day 50, uh, 150, we can see more mature uh, um, oligodendrocytes. And we can even see the presence of oligodendrocytes on the EM level. So to summarize what I have told you so far is that uh, we have developed a protocol allowing us to robustly generate four brain specific organoids, humical development. For example, the human, the presence of human specific neural stem cells, the human specific astrocytes, and also we can see the developmental trajectory that the uh, co-expression of upper and the deep cortical markers and its segregation, which is dependent on the wing cell B signaling. So we are also wondering whether our organoids can participate more physiological functions. So in order for us to do that, we decided to take a, a transplantation model systems. This is a, a work in collaboration with Isaac Chance Group at the UPenn. And the paradigm we used for transplantation is to use the adult rat. And we do a complete uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cap through the whole uh, cortex. Um, um, and then this, we can drop our organoids. In this case, we use a very kind of old organoids. We use uh, around the 80 day organoids into this uh, red cortex, visual cortex. See, since we can label organoids right, with the GFP, so you can actually 
if you shine a UV light, you can see red. And we are, can also follow the development of this transplanted organoids over time. And as shown here, uh, one month after, after the transplantation, two months and three months after the transplantation, they indeed grow actually larger in size over time. Well, the questioning of, of course, we are asking is that whether there's any communications between the transplanted human neurons and the host neurons. And indeed, if we just follow the GFP signal uh, that labels the human neurons, we can see that there are many projections from the human uh, neurons. For example, we can see uh, the axons uh, to the ipsilateral cortex. We can also see axons actually cross the corpus, uh, uh, across the midline and uh, go to the other hemisphere that in, in the control lateral cortical uh, into the thalamus region. And because of We, then we wonder whether there's any connections between the human neurons and the red ones. If to do that, I decided to use the transsynaptic tracer. So usually these are virus-based tracers. They can cross the synapse either from the presynaptic side to the postsynaptic side, or there's re uh, uh, or retrograde. They can cross from the postsynaptic side. To the presynaptic side. So in this slide, retrograde monosynaptic tracer, meaning that they can only cross the synapse once and the label the presynaptic partners. And in this case, we want to see whether there's any uh, red neurons can be labeled uh, by uh, by the tracer, meaning that there's a synapse forming from the red cell neurons to our human. And uh, because of the, our organ it use red and we rabies virus now becomes yellow because it contains both the rabies virus and their original red labeling. And we want to see after the trans the tracer trans the uh, uh transport into the other synaptic partner, only the rabies virus can be labeled, which is the GFP. So the presynaptic neurons can only be labeled by the GFP signal. And indeed, we can see the cells, this now the GFP label cells are the rest host cells from the rest. So the cortex, in the, uh, uh, the synaptic connections uh, in the cortex Adjacent to the transplantation site, we can also see cortical cells labeled far away from the uh, transplantation site. And uh, as I told you, because our transplantation is done at the visual cortex, one of the questions to ask is that whether any of the cells can participate into the function into the visual circuitry. So, so to do that, we use another strategy, as I mentioned, which is the anterograde uh, 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 virus. In this, in this case, is the HSV, herpes simplex virus. And it's different from the one that I just told you, which is a monosynaptic tracer. This one is a multisynaptic tracer that you can pass multiple synapses and the label multiple uh, neurons along the same pathway if they make synapses. And in, to do this, we transplant our organoids. And in this case, these organoids are not labeled before transplantation. And we inject this SHV tracer into the red retina. So if they're from the eye, making all the way to the transplanted organoids in the visual cortex, we should see the GFP signal from the tracer all the way to the human organoids. And this is indeed what we can see in addition to the normal 
uh, 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 axonal projection or connection regions, we can also see um, plenty of cells labeled by TFP all the way starting from the red ordina. Remember, this is not direct synaptic uh, connection. These are uh, multiple, uh, the, actually, it's through the relay of multiple synapses. And of course, the ultimate question is, even though they can make synapses, whether, the, whether these synapses are functional is a question, right? So we decided to do a functional testing by uh, after the transplantation, that we can use, stimulate, you use the light stimulation to stimulate the, through the eye and record directly from our organoids to see whether there's visual response in our human neurons. And this is shows some recording traces directly from the, this is from the red visual cortex, the red cells. And this is a recording from the human neurons after the transplantation. You can see the response wave and the response timing is actually quite similar to the naive uh, cells uh, within the red visual cortex. And this is actually a summarization of all the activity we can record from either direct visual cortex uh, in the red or from the organoids. And you can see many cells after the transplantation, we can record this visual responses by stimulating the eye. And another feature is that some of the visual cortical cells, they actually orientation selectivity means that they can respond to radiated light stimulation at certain angle. And uh, as uh, showing two examples here, we can even find human neurons exhibiting this orientation selectivity. Uh, indeed, there are a certain level of, of functional integration of human cells after the transplantation within the host of visual circuitry. Uh, I would like to summarize uh, the second part I told you that uh, by transplanting our organoids into the uh, red brain, we can show that this is the brain function after the insertion in this uh, large cavity. And this may suggest a potential revenue for us for the tr as a translational strategy to restore function after the cortical damage. And then for the last uh, few, uh, few minutes, I want to also switch a little bit and tell you a story that we did really during the pandemic time, which is related to COVID-19. And um, I guess I don't really need to do any introduction. This pandemic has, influ has uh, affected uh, everybody basically around the globe. And in addition to respiratory uh, 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 um, effects, it has been shown that many patients, some uh, studies also show that close to up to 80% of the patients with COVID-19, they also re uh, uh, present some neurological uh, problems, including uh, dizziness, and I guess you, uh, everybody know that there's a brain fog, and also headache, and, and uh, even neuropsychiatric symptoms. So the first thing we want to know then is that what could be the potential mechanisms? The brain symptoms, is that just a secondary effect because of the immune response or some systemic response or there's direct infection that the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in brain cells. And at the time, in addition to the cortical organoids, which I've been talking about for majority of the time, uh, that is uh, uh, with Fadi, we also have students, Sam and Wei Kai, who have been working on different type of brain that I didn't talk. Uh, for example, there's uh, Fadi is working on hippocampal organoids and Wei Kai and, and Sam are working on hypothalamic organoids and midbrain organoids. Of course, the, the first strategy is to ask whether there's any cells can be infected directly by SARS-CoV-2. So we just infected 
the four different types of organoids with this virus. And indeed, we can always identify some cells that can be infected. And on most conditions, these infected cells can be labeled by BCX, which meaning that the infected cells are neurons. But the infection rate actually is quite low. So we were kind of discouraged at the time. It's usually uh, less than 1% of the cells can be infected. Um, when we look at all different types of organoids. However, there are some exceptions. Uh, one of the or type of organoids is a hippocampal organoid, which is something we're still developing in the lab. And patterning sometimes is not very, uh, it's not an ideal situation. So in this hippocampal organoid, sometimes it also contains tissue or uh, origin of chorate plexus cells. Well, that can be labeled by TTR. And Fadi noticed that whenever the organoids contain the, the choriplex tissue, the infection seems to be more. He always see more cells being infected, suggesting to him maybe this is uh, the cell types that are more susceptible in the brain for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So he decided to generate a choriplex organoid directly. As you can see here, why we get choriplexis tissues from our organoids, because during development, this tube, uh, the, print, uh, the, the stem cell uh, in the neural epithelium just are right next to each other. And both are patterned by the wind and the BMP signaling, although uh, maybe there is a gradient. So Buddy decided to generate the choriplexis organoids specifically with high wind and the BMP. And indeed, you can see the morpho at the beginning, you don't see the difference. However, by 25 days, you can see the organoids become very different. You see this budding of transparent uh, tissues. And the, by 50 days, they have very this typical uh, epithelial morphology, uh, very similar to the choriplexis tissue. And he also showed that the, the organoids he generated are actually very pure for choriplexis cells, above 95%. If he look at three different markers for choriplexis cells, TTR, acaforin one and OTX2. And he did this for, from, uh, he generated this CPOs from two different lines and uh, they, they seem to be very similar in terms of uh, efficient differentiation efficiency. And again, we use the CPOs uh, and subject them to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And indeed, compared to less than 1% of our other brain organoids, we can see more than 10% infection when we look at the choriplexis organoids. And this infection, we, although we do a transient single-time infection, we see an increase in infection over time suggesting this is a productive infection, meaning that the cells being infected, they can further produce virus and infect additional cells. This is further confirmed when we directly measure the viral titers, either from the organoid lysis or from the culture supernatant, suggesting indeed you see this increase over time, suggesting the virus can be made and released. And what, is the consequence after the infection. And the first thing Fadi noticed is that, of course, there's an increased uh, cell death over time. And more interestingly, in addition to the directly infected cells, he also observed the increased cell deaths of non-infected cells, or the cells at least we cannot detect any direct viral infection, suggesting there's a not cell autonomous effect, but there's also cell non-cell autonomous effect in killing the cells after the SARS-CoV-2 infections. And also, of course, we can perform RNA sequencing of the, our uh, uh, um, uh, choriplexis organoids before and after the infection to different time points, and indeed consistent with what we observed in uh, in looking at the cell infection at the RNA level, we can also see the upregulation after the infection of all uh, 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 RNAs 
produced by the virus. And we can also see the result expression in, in, our, in, in the uh, core plexus organoids, including ACE2, PMPPS2, as well as NP, uh, neuropenin 1. So here I want, would like to summarize what we have seen through this RNA sequencing results. Indeed, we can see the viral production, upregulation of viral production process. We can also see increase of the cell death, uh, many uh, uh, RNA uh, upregulation related to cell death, which is also consistent to what we have seen at the cellular level. In addition, we also see upregulation of genes related to vascular because there is a close interaction between the choreplexid cells and the vasculature, as well as the skeleton. And more importantly, we see upregulation of many cytokines, suggesting also there is an immune response after the infection. What about downregulated genes? Uh, the choreplex cells, the other cells producing the uh, cortical spinal fluid, the CSF. So there are many uh, genes related to this function has been shown to be decreased after the infection, um, including the metabolism, cellular junction, cilium transport, as well as ion channels that are, that are directly related to this uh, uh, some, to their functions. So with that, I would like to summarize what I have told you in the last part. So we have identified a specific cell type, which is the uh, choreplex cells are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that leads to uh, uh, increase the cell death and the dysregulation in the immune response and a decreased uh, cellular functions of this choreplexis cells. So with that, I would like to close by acknowledging the people, although I, might have, uh, I, may, uh, I have already mentioned them during my talk, and of course, uh, Hong Jun and I have been collaborating over the past 20 something years. So uh, we uh, uh, have two uh, labs uh, working closely with each other. And especially for the organoids, Xu Yu is one of the pioneering uh, uh, um, students working uh, in developing many of our organoid protocols. And also uh, Fadi, Daniel, Sam, Wei Kai, and Sasha, yeah, these are the students also participating in different aspects that talk, and Yi Jing and Xu Jing are two postdocs to uh, working in the lab uh, uh, also contribute to the projects. I mentioned that our initial bio director was uh, that it, they are designed by three high school students. Um, of course, that's many years ago. They are already uh, graduated from college now. And also, uh, especially, I would like to thank collaborators who are working with us for the SARS-CoV-2 project, uh, Juan Carlos uh, and Ann Bon at, uh, at the UCSD and um, of course, Sanford Burnham at the uh, universities. And also, uh, the transplantation studies I already mentioned is a collaboration with Isaac Chen's lab at the Penn. And uh, of course, I would like to thank the funding uh, agencies for support, supporting my talk. With that, I would like to conclude and take your questions.